Well, I came today with my Joan Heyman Dole purse that was given to me by Marjorie Pierce. They were both native daughters together, and she gave this to me several years ago because she knew I would love it. It's horrible, but I love it. <laughs> okay. I'd like to pass this among you. This is a picture of Joan Heyman Dole with Terry Wincon, and it's one of my favorite pictures of her. And her cousin, Dee Groves, gave that to me years ago, and Craig Eve made a copy of it for me, so all these things. Anyway, the easiest way I found to do this, because there are so many aspects to this case, was to make a timeline, because that keeps me on track and it helps, you know, and if anyone has any questions, please stop me, questions or comments, because a lot of you know things that I don't know, because I see some local faces in here. <laughs> so, okay. Joan Margaret Heyman Dole was born on April 24, 1931. On February 7, uh, 1953, Joan marries John Dole, Jr. They were both students at Stanford. He was a graduate student. And uh, they divorced in 1960. In 1958, Juanita and Hugo Heyman moved to Rabbit Hill in Middletown from Los Altos. A lot of you remember the Heymans, Huck and Ski, they were on Rabbit Hill, they made jewelry for all of us kids, and they were just a lovely couple. They were experts in botany and the chaparral ecology, and they were just delightful people. In September of 1962, Joan Dole moves to Anderson Springs. November 22nd of that year, of 63, President Kennedy was assassinated. And I just bring this up because I remember these that very vividly. Because as a child, we used to go to the resort all the time. And that's when people didn't watch TV or have the internet, and people had conversations. That was, it was huge. And, really? and everybody talked about it. It, it, was, it was just very, very big everywhere. On June 13th of 1966, the U.S. Supreme Court hands down a fortified decision on Miranda versus Arizona, making it law that all criminal suspects be advised of their rights before interrogation. Say what year was that? 66. I bring up the Miranda law because it, it had a big, it was a big player in the Joe Dole murder trial. Okay. On July 1st, 1965, oh, I missed one. Okay, Joan moves into her new home on Ford Road. It's also Boris Brumfield's home for those of you who know Anderson Springs. Okay, Halloween of 1966, the firemen had a big carnival at the Middletown Firehouse, which is now the B&G Tire Center. And it was so fun. We used to have a fireman's auction every year where, you know, Reed Hardister, John Irwin used to go, and they were the auctioneers, Ray Moody. It was, it was really fun, but that's when the firemen was all volunteer, and they would raise money for everything with their auctions. Okay, on November 9th of 1966, uh, it was a Wednesday, Joan Dole's home was broken into. She arrived home after her work at the forestry department and discovered that drapes closed were closed in the front bedroom window. She calls her mother to find out why, because she always left her house open for the sun. They call the sheriff, and they find that someone has broken the front bedroom window where the lock is. And so Ted Libby, who was her boyfriend, he was the editor of our local paper, The Time Star. He repaired the window. He got Whitey Tollison out of bed to open up Hardister's, which was the corner store back then, and got the glass and made the repairs. They can't find anything missing. But uh, they think two packs of cigarettes are gone from on top of the refrigerator. One of the deputies, for some reason, feels that since nothing was missing, that they may have been dealing with a, a panty sniffer. So they have Joan empty the hamper, count her panties, and so everybody's really concerned, you know, because there might be this sexual deviant around. Uh, it was. It, it was enough of a scare for them that Ted wrote an article in the paper that, you know, beware burglar, Joan has a gun and she's armed and she knows how to use it. So everyone thinks, okay, this is, this is done, this is over. However, on November 18th, which was a Friday, 
her home was broken into for a second time. And this time the burglar broke in on her sun porch, the screen porch that hung over the creek. Uh, they found muddy footprints, um, and they found a camel cigarette floating in the toilet. Her sweaters had been looked through, and her purses had been looked through also in her closet. And she had some expensive silver. Her, her first husband was quite wealthy, and she had a lot of silver pieces, and some of those had been unwrapped and looked at and just left open in the living room. So now they were very concerned. Her mother wanted, you know, to do a stakeout and catch whoever this was threatening her daughter. And poor Joan had had her apartment in New York City broken into. They took the door off the hinges, cleaned her out there. And she had just, you know, it was just devastating for her because here she had come to be near her parents and have a home and she had a nice boyfriend. Anyway, so on November 19th, which was Saturday, Joan goes to Calistoga to buy supplies, ribbons, and candy and things for the Cinnabar shop, which the old Time Star building is where the new art gallery is on Highway 175. And the, in 1966, the front part of that was called the Cinnabar Shop, and they sold um, toys, games, a lot of things made out of wrought iron. Anyway, and uh, she was getting ready for Christmas. Okay, uh, she, came back, she came back from Calistoga, stopped at the Time Star, where Ted was working on getting out the Christmas edition and then they went back to her home on Ford Road. So they sat down to relax with some gallo burgundy. They knew how to live, okay? This was, this was big. So, uh, in evidence, uh, Ted Libby states that Joan began cooking dinner, which was fried chicken, about 10.30 at night, plus frozen peas and chocolate cookies for dessert. But it took a long time to cook the chicken, you know, because he liked it well done, and he said they drank wine and discussed their upcoming wedding. They were going to be married on December 26th. Now, they had just recently, Joan had recently told her parents that, and they were not pleased, even though Ted was a very nice man. I, I always liked him when I was a kid, but I think it was because he had a very nice voice, and he always paid attention to my sister and I. I mean, he always asked after us, and he, he had very nice manners. Anyway, Ted had been married and divorced four times previous to this, and so Joan would have been Mrs. Libby number five, and any parents would kind of give that the stink eye, I know. So anyway, they have their dinner, go to bed very late. Ted sets the alarm for early that morning so he can sneak out and nobody will know he spent the night. This is Middletown and it is 1966, so they were trying to keep it quiet that, you know, they were actually a real couple. So Ted says he left the home between 5.30 and 5.45 that morning to go back to his home, which was on Santa Rosa Avenue. He was renting a little, it sounds like kind of a hovel from Bill Miller, who happened to be Joan's boss at the forestry. And Sue, Evans, Sue and Norm Evans lived on the corner, and then there was a house, and then Ted's place, and then Bill Miller's. So Ted said that he used to put the clutch in when he ran around the corner so Sue wouldn't hear the engine and know he was coming home at that time of the morning. It was that kind of a situation. So Sunday morning, Ted got up, and they had planned for Sunday, as soon as she woke up and called him, they were going to put locks on and chain up the ladders that the last break-in was from a ladder through the screen porch. And so they had all these plans to secure the house, and they were going to uh, have one of the neighbors, his name was Walt Vervey, and he had been an investigator for an insurance company. They were going to set up a signaling uh, signal light with Walt so he would know Joan was in trouble because he was a little hard of hearing and they thought this would be the best way to alert him that she needed help. So that early that Sunday, Ted got a call to, uh, to come help unload Christmas trees for the Boy Scouts. and. So he went down there and they had already unloaded them and he saw a couple guys, he saw Dave Cook and his son and then later on Finney Palmer stopped by the paper and uh, Ted and Joan had been talking about going to Cozumel and Finney and his wife were going there that winter and they thought they might meet up in Mexico and it would be a great time. Anyway, it turns out that uh, 
Joe didn't answer the phone, and Ted kept trying to call, nothing happened, so he finally decided to drive out there to find out what was going on. And it was, had been storming very hard for several days, I mean, major rainstorm. And so when Ted passed the bridge on 175, headed, headed toward Cobb, he saw Mrs. Heyman coming towards him, and he thought, Oh, well, she's been up to Jones, and they were probably busy, and that's why she didn't answer the phone. So he almost turned around and went back to the paper. And then he thought, well, I'm this far. I might as well just go on out there, and we'll get those locks on and take care of everything. So he got to Jones' house and sees the drapes are pulled, and there's no smoke coming out of the chimney. Everything's quiet. So he goes up and calls. He did not have a key to her front door. So he taps on the window with the coin, then he beats on the side of the house with a rock, then he went around the back and he saw the ladder was up, and then he panicked. So he says he climbed the ladder, climbed through the cut screen, and he's calling out because he told her if she heard anything strange to shoot first and ask questions later. So he was worried about his own safety, but there was, you know, it was silent at the house. Anyway, he finds Joan in bed, and he can just see that she's been shot Actually, she's been shot once here and then a little farther down on the cheek on, on her right side, left side, anyway. He can see her in bed and he doesn't touch her, he doesn't do anything. He runs out and jumps in his car and drives over to the Vervey home, which is down Ford Road farther. They weren't home, but Ted was outside screaming, making so much noise that the neighbor came out and he had the key to the Vervey house and they had a phone. So they went in and called the sheriff from there. And then when they went back to Jones, the Vervais saw them there going by and they flagged him down and they waited for the sheriff to arrive. So the sheriff's officers got there, they start investigating and they discover that Joan has actually been shot five times. She's been shot twice in the head, once in each breast and in the, in the abdomen. And the rigor mortis is already pretty advanced when the mortuary fellows come to remove her body. And so Ted, while he's there, realizes that he's left the lead pot on at the newspaper. And in the old days, I guess you used to melt lead and you would make these pigs and then you would put, put your print on them and, and make mats. And he was making mats that day for the Christmas edition. And so he told the sheriff that he had to go back to the paper and turn the lead pot off. So it seems strange to everyone, and it seems strange to me reading about this now, that his fiance, the woman he's going to marry in a couple of weeks, is dead, and he had to leave. So anyway, he left, and on the way, he remembered that he had some pots catching drips of water at his house, because it was a pretty leaky old house. So he stopped and he emptied the rain pots and then he checked if his guns were still there, if those were okay. Then he went down to the paper and turned off the lead pot and then he assumed that the sheriffs were going to come pick him up so they could go tell Joan's parents what had happened up on Rabbit Hill. And they were trying to get Dr. Palladini to go with them because Mr. Heyman had a, had a bad heart. He had had four heart attacks and they wanted to be sure that this wouldn't actually shock him to death. Anyway. Ted finally did get up to see the Heymans and told them about Joan being killed and he had made some strange statements that she used to like sleeping with her arms above her head but when the body was found her, her arms were down and crossed on her stomach and he told the Heymans that she had been shot in her sleep and this was due to pain and that's why her arms were down. Anyway, so they pretty much didn't have any idea what had happened. Ted was friends with a lot of the sheriff's deputies, and so they pretty much took his word for you know where he had been and what time things happened. But he was very unclear on the times because he said, you know, we were just home. It was raining. We were having a glass of wine, talking about our honeymoon. What you know, we didn't look at the clock, so it was very hard to judge. Anyway, so for months. Nobody had an idea what had gone on. So this, this was huge because everybody was kind of fearful and it could be your neighbor, it could be an outsider. There was talk that there had been someone at the hotel, the Herrick Hotel, asking where Joan Dole lived and, you know, did anyone know who that was? Um, 
it was uh, it was very unnerving. And of course, every that's all anyone talked about. Any gathering at the bar at the resort. My sister and I were little. My mother would never hire a babysitter, so we always went everywhere. And so we were always in the bar, and we heard people talking, guessing what could have happened. You know, um, it was it was very very intense. And back then, we used to have like the cleaner for cleaning your clothes. They would come to your house and pick up your clothes and then deliver them. You know, the following week. So. My, anyone that was a stranger was given the stink eye for a long time. So, they're try, Lake County is trying to figure out what's going on. They, they just don't have a clue. So, surprisingly, okay, where's my, there was, uh, in March, March 24th of 1967, okay, the murder was November 20th of 1966, so March of 1967, an Anderson Springs resident named Albert Birchol happens to stop for a drink at the Buckhorn Inn on Highway 29 north of St. Helena. So behind the bar he sees a muzzleloader rifle and he asks the bartender, you know, where he got it. And he wants to take a closer look at it. Well, the gun happens to be a gun that Mr. Birchol had made himself from a kid and it had been stolen from his home in Anderson Springs. So, he left the bar and called the sheriff, and the bar owner, whose name was F.W. Aldridge, told the sheriff he'd purchased the gun for $75 from David Dean Wilson, a local fellow. Uh, he was 24 years old, and he uh, turned out David had been working for PG&E as a meter reader. So, they do a little investigating, and on March 30th, uh, they arrest David Wilson for burglary. And he was living on Bale Lane at the time, which is off Silverado. And they get to his home, and he kind of admits that he's been breaking into homes and stealing guns and sporting equipment on his PG&E meter reading route. And he had only been reading in Lake County just for a couple of months. And finally, he admits eventually, by the time they get him up to the Lake County Jail, that he had broken into Joan Dole's house, but he only admits to the November 9th burglary. But he starts pulling stuff out. He's got wetsuits, bows and arrows, rifles, guns, ammunition, all the stuff that he's been taking, because in 1966, Lake County was very small, and we probably had a population of 10,000 countywide year-round, and most of the places in Anderson Springs were summer homes. Anyway, and in some of, uh, while David Wilson is turning over to the sheriff's officers the things that he's stolen, there's a large box full of ammunition. And they ask him what that is, and he said it was his grandfather's, you know, but then uh, he'd had it for years. And so they start looking inside, and they find several 32 long bullets, which I think I have a couple here, which I didn't. I didn't realize what longs and shorts and everything were, but 32 longs are a pretty, pretty substantial round. And that we can do the touchy feely, but anyway, they they had five bullets out of out of Joan Dole that were just like that. And what the sheriff noticed was in this box of ammunition from the grandfather that the 32 ammunition happened to be bright and shiny. And, you know, and Wilson claimed that he had never had a 32, owned a 32, shot a 32. But they, one of the things they found when they were removing Joan's body, when they were inspecting her bedroom, they found a cartridge of a 380 in just the outer casing under her bedspread. And so all these different ballistics things, anyway, it was confusing, but they did find that David Wilson had sold a 380 to a, a Hell's Angel biker in St. Helena. So they, they found out that he had this gun and he'd gotten it when he got out of the army, and anyway. So they 
how did Jack Jones, who was the California Bureau of Investigation agent that Lake County had called in to help them because they were having a, a really difficult time trying to figure out what this was. And it, yes? What was the caliber of the, of the bullet in, in the uh, woman? Uh, 38 long. Uh, yeah, 32, 32 long, okay, 32 like long. Bullet. And then this, this 380 bullet was an anomaly because they couldn't find any slugs from that, but they had the casing under mm -hmm. her bed. And Joan's parents used to clean for her on every, every Thursday, and Mrs. Heyman was um, very precise, and she scrubbed the doorknobs every time, every weekend, and they cleaned and vacuumed under everything. And she had not seen it on the 19th, when, or she cleaned on the 18th, and then the bullet was there on the 20th. Anyway. So they have David Dean Wilson in custody, so Jack Jones, the CBI agent, suggested he drive around, or they drive him around Lake County, and he tell them, you know, show them the homes that he's broken into. And it turns out one of the attempts was on Jack Jones' own home in Clear Lake Park, that they could see the scratch marks, and he pulled the screens off the house to try and get in his summer place. So. They think they've, they've got him for the burglary anyway. They're, they're thinking maybe he's good for the murder, but there's no way to tie it all together. So, uh, okay, there, okay. So, they finally, they find a report in Napa County. There was a deputy, George Roxon, who was working really closely with Ray Land, a Napa, Napa County sheriff's officer. So he went down there and went through all of their reports because there was a, on Soda Canyon Road, another road off uh, Silverado, a lawyer named Ridley Stone had reported a break-in. He didn't know which weekend it was, but he had a 32 pistol stolen from his home. And it happened to be, it was, it was either September or October of 1966. So in checking the records, it turned out that, uh, oh, and the other thing, Mr. Stone's 76 acre property was behind a locked gate. And only he and PG&E had the keys. And guess who his meter reader was? It was David Wilson. So. This was, you know, they thought this was dynamite. They had the gun, they had this. So to try and put the gun together with the murder weapon, Mr. Stone told them that he had only shot the gun like four times and he'd shot it at a rattlesnake on his ranch. So Lake County sheriffs went down there, they dug up where the snake was, they found the four slugs that he shot, they sent it to the FBI and they couldn't match it because they didn't have the gun at that time. They couldn't match it, but they had those four rattlesnake slugs and they had the five bullets taken from Joan's body. So, pretty soon in, I have my pages mixed up here. Um, on May 26 of 1967, William Reagan of Clear Lake found a rusted 32 revolver while strolling downstream from the bridge on Pewter Creek with his uh, grandnephew. So he brought the gun home and laid on his dresser for about three weeks and then he finally called uh, Sheriff Ed Anderson and asked him if he'd be interested in this gun and the sheriff was like, yes, because one of Wilson's friends had said that he had, if, if he was trying to get rid of something, he'd throw it in, in the water, throw it in the body of water. So they had this rusted out gun but Mr. Ridley Stone also had a misfired cartridge from his 32, and so they had the firing pin impression from the rattlesnake pistol on this gun. So they sent it down to a, uh, a ballistic specialist, D. Wayne Wolfer in Los Angeles, and he found out from, from the firing pin because the, the barrel was entirely too rusted to fire anything through to, to compare the slugs, that the firing pin impressions were the same. So we find out the Pewter Creek gun and the Rattlesnake gun are one and the same. David Wilson was a meter reader, so this is looking like really bad for David. However, 
uh, it was looking bad for Ted Libby also because of the timing of when he said they ate, her stomach contents, um, the, the rigor mortis in her body. Um, there were doctors that said that she couldn't have been alive past 5.30 a.m. It was a, a doctor in a Napa, forensic specialist in Napa, so it, it, was, it looked bad for Ted also. And mostly when they went back to do a reenactment, uh, the sheriff's department took Ted Libby back to her home and said, well, show us what happened, you know, the morning of the 20th when you went to find Joan. And so he ran around and tapped on the window and hit the wall, and then he went to climb in the house to show how he went up the ladder. Well, it took him five tries, and he finally had to get down and move the ladder and then climb in, and then his excuse was that, well, he was trying to think how Joan's ex-husband would have done it because he was crippled in one leg with polio and he figured that he was really the killer and so he was just thinking about how John Dole would have done it and it sounded stupid and it was stupid and he should never have said that but anyway so everyone's getting ready they're preparing for the trial and in okay um, in August of 1967 Timothy Luce and Susan Bartolome were hitchhiking after their car broke down on Highway 101 south of Ukiah. They were picked up by 18-year-old spree killers Thomas Braun and Leonard Main. Susan was raped several times and both victims were shot and left for dead on the side of the road. Uh, Susan was crippled for life. She did survive and describe her attackers and they were found four days later in a motel in Jamestown, California. Well, Timothy Luce was the only son of David Luce, who was the district attorney of Lake County. So there was a big discussion about actually letting David Luce try this case because he was broken by the death of his son, of course. But the murder was August 23rd, and on September 19th, David Luce, he presented the case against David Wilson to the grand jury for indictment. And Wilson was charged with first degree murder and burglary. He pleaded not guilty, and the trial was set for April of 1968. Okay, so September, they indict Wilson. November 16, 1967, was my grandparents' 40th anniversary. And so there was a large cocktail party at my dad's restaurant, the Country Club on Cobb. And of course, all anyone talked about that night, it was like, happy anniversary, did you hear the latest about the murder, you know? <laughs> and I just, I remember so clearly, um, Heather McGregor and Karen Emerson were there, and they were the older girls. And so they knew things that we didn't know. And so we were, it, it was so, it was just so thrilling, you know, for us to be a part of that. But. Everything I've been able to tell you so far, I was able to find out from the court records. And the way that I was able to get the court records was, uh, my aunt used to be the head clerk at the courthouse. And so she used to, she said when they weren't busy, they used to read the dailies. And they, they, everybody was still a mystery. They talked about it amongst themselves up on the fourth floor there. It was a big deal. And I said, well, where are they? Can I read them? You know, are they public records? And she says, well, yeah, you should, that you should be able to get a copy of, you know, go ask. So I went to the courthouse. They had no records. I called the sheriff's department. They had no records. I called the attorney, that, uh, the, Mr. Luce's office, his family. They had no records. So my cousin John Flynn is the investigator for the district attorney's office and he says well you know he says did you ever talk to Carl Potswald he was the court reporter and he had retired to Colorado and back then this was 15 years ago everything was free on the internet so you could just look up somebody and it gave you their phone number and everything so I called Mr. Potswald he had all the records from the trial and because his wife had wanted to write a book about it <laughs> so, so uh, he said if I would pay the UPS he would ship me what he had. So for 15 bucks, I got 3,800 pages of testimony, which was a great buy. And then, you know, of course, I went to the libraries and microfiche and news, old newspaper articles, 
And then I found uh, Boni Saludes, who was a reporter from the Pes Press Democrat, and so I talked to him. We had lunch many times, and he told me what he remembered. And, and I found uh, the son of the defense attorney who lives on Soda Canyon Road, the same place where Ridley Stone lived. And he gave me what he had left of his father's old files. And so it was wonderful because I was shocked because this was considered an unsolved murder that there weren't any records left in Lake County. I, I couldn't believe it. And then I also found out, I talked to Bob Keyes, and he told me, oh, he remembered when they cleaned out the basement of the courthouse, and they had all the hoods from the White Cap murders. They threw those away. They threw everything away. And it's like, I'm sitting in a museum, and we're all, yeah, very, very bad stuff. Yes? I have a question about the bullets. You said that there were five bullets that killed John Yes. When they did the ballistics testing, did they, were those included in the testing as well? Well, they couldn't fire anything from the gun they found in right. the creek. And but so, I mean for the, because you said the... Firing pin? Yeah. Right. Well, the firing pin's only on the, the casing, and then the bullets, the lead oh, part. Oh, and they didn't and have so, the and so, Yes. So whenever a bullet's fired, it, it explodes out of the casing, right. and so, yeah. So that's, that's the I, I had to have the sock puppets to explain this to me. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was tough. And then I couldn't get 32 long and 32 short or 38s. And it was, it was tough. But anyway, Sandy, yes. There was one, one part that's still missing for me is they had the slugs from the body and they had the slugs from the rattlesnake pistol. Yes. Did they compare those? Well, they, they couldn't, because I guess, I don't know if it was the dirt, but they couldn't, they couldn't make a determination. And then they couldn't, and even if those were the same, they couldn't tie in the gun because they couldn't get the slugs tied into the gun. They had like these open-ended little things, which it seems totally logical that that, I mean, I mean, I get it, it's like, yeah, Wilson did it. But after a two-month trial, which they brought in, they, uh, Mr. Group, who was at Morris Group, who was from San Francisco, he was the defense attorney. He was very well known, and I think David Wilson's parents did him the biggest favor in the world by hiring this guy because he just steamrolled David Luce in the trial. And I talked to two of the people who had served on the jury. They've passed since, but this was 15 years ago. And they said just unanimously, everyone thought Ted Libby had killed her, and Wilson was innocent. And Mr. Group called in Paul Kirk as a forensic witness. Paul Kirk was very famous for having worked on the Sam Shepard case. I mean, this is a high dollar guy. He was very, very famous. And today he's known as the father of forensics. But he gave evidence that whoever had shot Joan had been in bed with her. Because another thing about the five wounds in Joan was they were all contact wounds which means within two inches. And it turns out, you can see it a little bit, these were some pictures that Mr. Group's son, Liel, had that he let me copy. But on the satin binding of the blankets in the bed, there's an impression of the cross hatching on the grip of the pistol. Because when you fire a pistol at point blank range, the gases that come out of the end of out of the muzzle of the gun are, are in excess of 1,200 degrees. So it melted the satin binding on the blanket and left the impression of the grip of the gun. And I mean, somebody had the gun down there and you know, and shot her that way. So Sandy, was she, she wasn't shot five times in the head. No, twice in the head, once in each breast, and then in the abdomen. So it was like in the shape of a cross. Now. Mr. Group brought up, brought up a good point. Why would, why would a sneak thief shoot this woman in such a personal way? I mean, this was obviously anger. You know, there, there was something really, really wrong here. And they proved that David Wilson always broke into empty homes. Why would he go into a home where there was someone living? Uh, he was a meter reader. He could see the meter. He knew somebody was there. 
um, there were, he brought up a lot of things that, um, these are just some other photos, and then of course they had like the bloody sheets and nightgown and, you know. What was really strange to me is um, what did exist and what didn't exist, and I was told that um, one of our former sheriffs has a lot of souvenirs. I don't know if this is true or not, and of course he didn't want to talk to me. So. But, you know, it, it's, um, and, and the other thing that came up in the trial, which I thought was really funny, because Alvy Rochester talked to us, and, and he was one of the investigating officers. Um, he said that the Middletown ladies used to caravan up to Lakeport for the trial because they were worried that their husband's name might come up because Joan was quite a femme fatale. You know, and they thought that she might have mentioned them somehow. But we had, um, at that time in Middletown, we had a, a barber named Vince Taylor who was on the corner where, where, um, where uh, the, the old barber shop was, where, where Wayne's shop was. And Vince had written Joan a couple of mash notes. And they were Shakespearean in their eloquence. I mean, the, they were just, just way out there. And he signed them Crusader Rabbit, who was like a cartoon <laughs> character in the <laughs> 50s. Yeah. So um, anyway, so they investigated. Vince, they investigated the fellows that she worked with at the forestry and basically it turned out at the forestry that there was a little slap and tickle going on but it was nothing really serious, you know, and you know, Joan was friends with Carl Nielsen, they investigated him, they went down and visited with her ex-husband who was teaching down in San Francisco, he was living in Berkeley, and as I say, he, he had, uh, had polio as a child. And he, he did come from a very wealthy family in Indiana, and his background was, you know, he had grown up swimming with FDR down at Warm Springs because he had been sent down there for his polio when he was young. And I'd spoken to him about Joan before he passed away and what he remembered. And I mean, it, it was just such a, it's, it's interesting, but then I was remind myself, we're talking about somebody's family, this lovely woman, you know, it, it's just amazing. Yes. I was asked to hand that to you. Oh, well, there's David. Yeah, I tried to talk to David Wilson because Bill and Sylvia Wink had told me that they knew him. Oh, and there's there's Mr. Group and there's Mr. Libby. Yes. Okay. <laughs> this this is terrific. Okay, we have to pass this around because these are like the characters. But. Um, I totally blanked out. Us. Totally Worms blanked out. Warm shrinks. Oh, okay. All right. So that was okay. John Dole. Okay. Joan. John Dole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, anyway, Mr. Group had claimed that in talking about their wedding, that Joan had bought this bathing suit from Fredericks of Hollywood. And I don't know if any of you remember the catalogs from Fredericks of Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> they were. I've never forgotten either. <laughs> they were they were pretty wild because my mom used to get them. She never bought anything, but we just were glued to them. They were like porn in the sixties. I enjoyed them too. Yeah. <laughs> so she had this black bathing suit, and so Ted had said that if if she took that on their honeymoon, that he would like rip it to shreds, and so. Group's theory was that they had gotten drunk because they, they, she had like eight glasses of wine or something that night, and so he thought that she got, they had both gotten drunk, and in a fit of jealous rage, he had killed her. Well, t and talking about drunk, that was another one of the problems because during the autopsy, which was done at Jones and Lewis in Lower Lake, Dr. Carl Agard was called in to do the autopsy. So they took a blood sample to, you know, to do the alcohol test on, and turns out that Dr. Agard was pretty cheap, and he reused his sample bottles. And so they rinsed out the bottle, but it had formaldehyde in it, and the bottle was fine, but the cork liner in the top of the cap was saturated with formaldehyde, so then they were they had to theorize did somebody give her then i had to learn the difference between ethyl alcohol and methyl alcohol 
which ethyl alcohol is what's in wine, but methyl alcohol is wood alcohol. That's the bad stuff that makes you go blind or kills you. And then they realized that Dr. Agard, you know, had reused the bottles, and that's what happened, and it, it ruined all the samples. And he had just like estimated things as to her weight and her height. He had her driver's license, but he estimated she was five foot six. Joan was like five foot eleven, you know, and that she weighed 135 pounds. Well, Joan weighed 180 if she was, you know, anyway. So all all of their theorizing and all of the you know alcohol burn off rates and everything it doesn't work unless you have the correct height and weight or the weight of the person is the main thing anyway um, I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything major I probably am but anyway the trial took two months and the jury acquitted David Dean Wilson in like three hours so everyone in Middletown thought that the district attorney would turn around and then charge Ted with the murder and they, they didn't because he said that he knew who did it and that you know he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't bother with, bother Ted with that so oh I was telling you how I, got, how I was able to track this down anyway so my aunt as I said worked at the courthouse and so I kept asking her questions about this and telling her, you know, that I'd gotten the dailies. And I said, how, how can I get any more information? You know, I just, I'm kind of at a, I was trying to talk to people that were around Middletown at that time. And everybody was very kind, you know, were telling me what they remembered from 1966. And she, we happened to be at a golf tournament. And she says, well, why don't you ask Bill Harpham? And I said, well, I don't know him. And she says, he's sitting next to you at dinner. And so he was retired Judge Bill Harpham, and he had run against David Luce for district attorney, and Luce won. It was quite a bitter race. But anyway, Judge Harpham gave me George Roxon's number, who was the rattlesnake bullet detective. And then George Roxon opened some other doors for me and told me people to talk to, and that's how I found Alvy Rochester in Hillsburg. And Alvy was terrific, you know, remembering that it was his job from the sheriff, who was Ed Anderson at that time, to follow Mr. Luce at lunchtime to make sure he wouldn't drink because he was still suffering from his, the loss of his son. And I mean, the poor man was, you know, I mean, he was a wreck. And it showed because his, he kept jumping up in the trial and screaming, in, in, incompetent, immaterial, and something else. But it was, that was just like his thing. And, I thought, oh my God, this would have been so hard to listen to. And plus the trial was at the old courthouse, which is a museum in Lakeport now, that whole second floor. That's where the trial was held because the new courthouse wasn't completed yet. And so they kept having to try and talk over the construction of the new courthouse being built. And they had the windows open because it was hot in there and no air conditioning and it, it just must have been miserable. But. Anyway, so I always thought, well, you know, obviously with the gun thing that the sheriffs both swore that, or the sheriffs that I talked to said they knew that Dave Wilson did this. You know, they, they knew it, knew it, knew it. Other people I talked to said Ted Libby did this. There's no way that a burglar would come in and shoot a woman that many times. And he would be the only one that would know, you know, that nobody could hear the bullets. And I mean, just the sound in a closed room of one shot going off, but five shots. It, it's just incredible that somebody could do that. Anyway, so I thought when I read the dailies that I would know the truth, that it would just be so obvious to me who did it. It wasn't. So a few years ago, um, Wayne the Barber told me that he knew this fellow Ernie Suchek and he, Ernie had a story to tell. So Ernie lived right on the corner at Dry Creek Cutoff, um, opposite where Bill and Sylvia Wink used to live, when they, on the, right on the corner they were going up to Anderson Springs. So I called Ernie and he had me come over to talk with him. And he told me that his story, and he says, I, I tried to tell the sheriffs this, but nobody wanted to listen to him, that 
on the morning, and he remembered that morning because it had been raining so much that weekend. He had gone out to get some more firewood because it had just been torrential, and he thought, well, now's the time to go load up the, the wood box. So he was standing out in his yard, and he heard this car coming. And he says, it was just racing. And he says, so I stopped. He says, I had an armload of wood, and I stopped. And this car went by, and he says, it was either a Plymouth or an Olds. And back then, I mean, this guys knew what cars were, and cars really looked different back then. I mean, we didn't all look like, you know, a slice of cheese going down the road. So, and he remembered that day because his wife, Franny, had gone into town to go to the post office, and she had heard about Joan being killed, and came back and told him, at, you know, when he was stacking the wood, and he was like, oh my God, that's, you know, incredible. So, I was thinking, wow, that's interesting, you know. And so in reading the dailies, I found that on Sunday, November 20th, David Wilson was reading his meters in Anderson Springs, or he didn't say Anderson Springs, he was reading in Clear Lake that day because he had to go up with his friend on Saturday to retrieve a motorcycle. He had been on this enduro race um, in Bartlett Springs and his bike had stopped, so he had to get his dad's pickup truck and his friend to go up and pick up his bike. So he had to go read his meters on Sunday the 20th. And David Wilson had a loaner car from Zumwalt Ford, and it was a 1958 Oldsmobile. And so I'm thinking, oh my God. So did he go, did, I mean, so he could have gone up there, shot Joan, and then raced back, or did he go up there to break into the house again and find her dead and was racing away like, oh my God, there's a dead woman in there. I don't know, but I thought it was so cool that Ernie Suchek had seen that and it was an old Ernie, it was an old, you know, so it's, uh, I, I still wait for people to tell me things that they knew. I worked, um, my boss was a probate referee and so he was saying, oh, you can find out lots of things, you know, if you go to someone's funeral service or their, their wake because, you know, people tell stories and it's a great time and everything. Well, on February 14, 2010, David Wilson died here in Lake County. And he was only 66, and so they were having a wake for him at Hillcrest, which was his sister's bed and breakfast. And so I got my friend to go with me because I didn't want to go alone. And I thought, well, we'll just blend in and I'll hear all these stories and it'll really open up my eyes to what kind of person. Because I had written him several letters. I phoned him. He, he wouldn't talk to me. And my husband says, well, my God, why does he want to rake up the past? This was a traumatic event for him. Why would, why would he talk to anybody about it? You know, he was shocked that he mentioned it to Bill and Sylvia, you know, years ago. So anyway, so we went to this wake. And let's just say... I think everyone there was family, and either they thought we were parole officers, or I don't know what, but nobody would even smile at us. It was the most <laughs> wretched, uncomfortable, you know, so we kind of slunk out of there after we, we walked around trying to be friendly and smiling, and nobody, nobody would speak to us, but they were all in leathers and tattooed up the neck, and it was like, <coughs> oh, we kind of don't fit in. So <laughs> it was awkward, but anyway. And then... Um, I found the woman who did end up being Ted Libby's fifth wife. Um, her name is Marjorie Brandon, and she lives in Calistoga. She's a lovely woman still. She's just very attractive. And I called her, and she wouldn't talk to me until I mailed her a copy of Ted Libby's death certificate. She said she was that afraid of Ted that she wouldn't speak to me. So I thought, well, wow, maybe Ted was a secret monster that nobody knew. But she, uh, she, she did talk to me, but she didn't really know anything. It's just her feeling of, you know, that he was a jerk, and he probably did it. So, but that's where it stands. And I, I was really thinking that I would eventually come across like the truth, and this is the only truth I know. So, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, do you think Ted Libby wasn't um, questioned or indicted because of who he was at the time? 
that was a lot of what the defense attorney put forward that he had you know a relationship with the sheriff's department and that they, they were buddies and that could very well be why he wasn't he wasn't you know looked at as carefully as he might have been yeah you mentioned Boris's house. Is that the house where he used to live? Because I, I know Boris. I've been there. Yes, that's that's the that's the house where the murder was. Yes. Wow. Yeah. She's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think I heard that you said Ted Libby saw Mrs. Heyman on his pastor in the car. Yes. Was it checked whether she saw him or not? She did see him. She did see she him. She did see him at that time, and she had Terry Rincon and Lene Barcelo in the car with her. They were going to go have lunch on Rabbit Hill. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, they, they must have been so upset, Joan's parents, but because they already didn't like the idea of the relationship. And so yes. did they feel that, did they have a feeling? Do you know? You know, um, or in the interviews, and what, what I got from Mr. Group's son, Leal, were the statements. And the statements are actually more fascinating than the trial because people can say anything and just go off and kind of, they're not under oath, so they can, you know, point the finger and say things and, you know, whatever. And uh, Mrs. Heyman was very supportive of Ted and they were, they were, very, they were very nice about him. However, um, after the funeral, and Sylvia Wink, God bless her, knew this, um, Ted arranged the funeral and it, because the, the parents were devastated. And there's a big ground off spot on her headstone. It's, it's one of those brass plaques and it's set on a, on a rock at the Middletown Cemetery. And, I, and so I went up to, because I knew that you used to get those brass plaques back in 1966. The only place you could get them was at the jeweler in Clear Lake, which is um, it was Gordon Ness, and now it's now it's Kevin Ness, his son. And I said, you know, do you have any records from back then of your dad's? And you know, could, could I find out what this said? Well, anyway, I was talking to Sylvia Wink, and she says, oh, I know what that said. And it's like God's small town, right? Mm -hmm. It said, "Intended bride of Ted J. Libby," and he had that put on her headstone. And her parents later had it ground off. And to me, that was like a dog peeing on a tree. She was mine, you know. It was just this was my woman, and you know. But I think, you know, he was jealous because Joan Joan was attractive, and this was a prize, you know, for him. So, were there any interviews with any of Ted's exes other than Mrs. Brandon? Um, actually, I talked to his second and it's like second and his third wife, and she was. She was nice about him, you know, she, she just said that they didn't get along. No, I only talked to one of his ex-wives, because Louise was his fourth wife. And the interesting one about story about that, which I, I love Sue Evans, because she happened to be at that dinner where I met Judge Harpam also. And so Sue, Sue had told me this story, that she was friends with Louise, who was Ted's fourth wife. And Ted used to live out right where the bridge is, opposite where Galen Palmer's house was, right outside of Anderson Springs. And the county took his property by eminent domain to build the bridge. Well, so before this happened, Ted had invited Mom to bring my sister and I down to go swimming there, because he had this beautiful sandy spot in the creek, and you know, it was, it was, it was very nice. And I remember going out there and my mother telling us only going up to your knees and of course you know we're up to our chins out there and then we had to drive home and it was cold because she had a little convertible well anyway Sue Evans said that they had been out to a party there and Ted was in the Air Force when he was uh, during during World War II and his eyes weren't good enough for him to be a pilot which is what he really wanted to be but instead he would go around and he would like sell bonds and drum up and promote the Air Force and everything. So he had a full uniform and the boots and everything. Well, so Sue said she had to go to the bathroom. And to get to the bathroom in their cabin, you had to go through the bedroom. And she said the uniform was on the wall with the hat up there, the whole thing pinned out like, you know, like it was like on the wall. And then the other thing was that Ted and, this is so bad, this is such gossip. 
but anyway, that, that, that they had like this, she said it was like a ping pong ball net, but it was something like a canvas going down the middle of the bed because they were fighting and he didn't want her touching things. <laughs> and then this uniform up there and it was like, okay, that's weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's so bad. But that's, and that's probably what keeps me looking for things or great stories like that that people tell you because it was like, wow. But anyway, so that, um, when I interviewed Mr. Group's son, Liel, who was, he was very kind to me. And he even called David Wilson to tell him that he was giving me these things, if he had any, you know, anything to say against it. And Leal told me that his father always felt Ted was guilty. And even after this, uh, in 19, in what was it, December of 68, whenever it was, I think it was December 20th of 1968 was the first Zodiac killing. And he says, I always, he says, my father and I always felt that Ted looked just like the drawing, you know, with the glasses and, the, you know, anyway. So they were trying to hang Ted for whatever they could hang him for. But, um, but he even, they had even researched it. And he says, you know, he was in the Air Force and he had wing walker boots and he had this and he had that. And it was like, wow, you know, I mean, that would have been interesting if the Zodiac had lived in our midst, but I don't think he really did. Um. I, I hope I got this right. When you were talking about the night that he's he spent the night when he spent the night with her. Yes. And he got up early to leave so people wouldn't know that he spent the night. And then later on you talked about uh, the fact that she was found dead that same morning. Yes. But then when they went to get the body, the body was already in River Mortis and maybe it was coming out. Um, it seemed like they would have been able to backtrack because someone probably heard him go home. You mentioned that too, mm heard -hmm. his engine. They would have been able to backtrack if they had been really looking for the person who killed her. They would have been able to backtrack, figure out when he left her house because someone heard him come home. Well, and apparently nobody out did. How long yeah. Mm -hmm. Her body would have had to have been dead. To but the doctor, the doctor had the weight wrong. So yeah, he was, yeah. he was the doing all the figuring well, doing his job. Right, and then the doctor said that, well, nobody told me to estimate the time of death. And it's but like, what, is, what does a pathologist do? Exactly. Isn't that what, you know, he, he was, I think he was the one that was really remiss in this with messing up the samples and not, you know, he, he was, um, he was a doctor in Lakeport for a long time. You know, he would come down and he ran the, he ran the blood lab up there. I mean, everyone remembers Dr. Agard, yes. Okay. Yes. Hi. Um, whatever happened to her memorial about? It's, you know, um, it's a big cross with the lights that will come on. And I don't know. You know, the the you now the Audubon Society had it, and then did the Lake something? The land trust. Yeah, the Land Trust has it now. Is there still the plaque up there? On you know, I don't know, but I will find out. I haven't been up there for several I've years. I've been up there. Yeah. I don't know what I was looking at, but there is some. It used to have a plaque on it because you know at, at one time and nobody knows who did this but Jones Anna Peterson told me because she was Anna Peterson was a teacher at Middletown at Minnie Cannon and she and the Heymans were very good friends that someone pried the plaque off Jones gravestone and it ended up on the top of cop and somebody rescued it and brought it back down and they glued it back on, but I just thought that was really odd. I mean, poor Joan keeps getting stolen from now. Yes. The uh, person I was talking to last week said to ask you about the old coot who hung around her gift shop. They thought he was the one who did it. Really? Could have been Vince. It could, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could have been Vince. Yeah. I have to share, I got a bowl from the Haymans after Joan died. Uh huh. Um, it was Steuben crystal bowl. Uh -huh. I still have it to this day. Beautiful, very delicate looking, but when you pick it up, mm -hmm. it's heavy and it's got little claw feet and it's got Steuben. Yeah. So, and I always just think of her when I see that, that bowl. And Mrs. Hayman would give it to And yeah, Mrs. Hayman gave it to me after she died. Sandy? Yes. Just, I was wondering, you said that Mrs. Hayden and Lene and uh, Terry were all coming out. Were they coming? They weren't coming from her place. They did not know. No, she had just she had gone to pick up Terry 
who lived out there also. Yeah, but who lived out on, on 175. And what happened to Libby? When did, when did he pass or whatever? Um, Ted died in uh, Cave Junction, Oregon and in uh, May of 1998. And I had called and talked to his niece. In fact, I got a copy. It used to be much easier now with terrorism and everything. You can't just get people's birth or death certificates. But I got his death certificate. I saw who the informant was called her, turned out she was his niece, and then she told me all these things, and uh, she gave me some other numbers, and I called and talked to Ted's half-brothers who lived over in Fresno, and they gave me some, you know, I mean, it was, I, I really tried to be thorough and just follow the breadcrumbs, basically, but, yeah. You say uh, informant? I guess I missed that part. Oh, on, on, the, on the death certificate. There's oh, always a person that gives the information, mm -hmm. and she was up there living near Ted, yeah. What happens now? What happens now is, I'm, I'm just hoping somebody will call me and say, oh, don't you know that so-and-so is, yeah. Um, I, I have started, and I'm obviously, obviously not very disciplined about writing this. <laughs> but it's almost more fun to talk about it with people that remember or have some connection. Um, I was even able to track down Terry Rincon and she lives in Tennessee now. And she's got four children, I believe. Yeah. And she married, um, she married a Marine captain who's now a minister. And they have a, their own church, kind of. And she sounded very happy. And she just had lovely memories of Joan and the Hamans, of course. And Terry, um, poor Joan, always wanted children. And when she was married to Mr. Dole, she had like five miscarriages. And her last child would have been born on July 7th. And it turned out when she met Terry, that was Terry's birthday. And so Terry always called Joan her other mother. And Joan, um, I guess for one Christmas, she had gone out and bought all the children's classics and wrapped them each in a different color with a rainbow and gave those to Terry for Christmas. And she had always remembered that, and you know, that, that they were so good to her. Was Carl Nielsen ever exist? Actually, he gave, yeah, Carl, Carl gave testimony, and um, Ted kind of tried to make him a suspect. You know, he kind of drew him in because there was, there was jealousy there. There was definite jealousy there. But um, they, they knew Carl didn't, you know, have anything to do with it. And in fact, after, I tried to talk to Carl, and he wouldn't talk to me. And so after he died, um, his sister's name was in the paper, and she lived back in Massachusetts or somewhere. Anyway, so I called her. So she told me what was going on. So, yeah, it was it was real interesting. But I know the Haymans had wanted Joan to marry Carl. They loved him very much, and they even admitted that. But um, yeah. Well, my my dad works for the forestry. Did you say that? The forestry guys were questioned? Yes. And I think my dad would, was questioned because he was very upset about it. Remember Martha? Mm -hmm. He was very upset about mm -hmm. that. And uh, That's, I know, uh, I guess the forestry guys, which was very kind, they, they took turns like watching her home after she was killed to make sure that nobody else would break in and take anything. And they just did that on their own, you yeah. know, out of respect for the Haymans and for her, which was nice. But, yeah. But, but all, I, all of us kids went up there and got our rings, huh? Yeah. 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 Yes. And the flutes. The shepherd's pipes. Yeah. Remember yeah. 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 all the hummingbirds they had up there? Oh. Yeah. Hundreds. hundreds. That's yeah. And you know, I was, I was looking because they they worked with this botanist out of New York, and there was a little book that Mrs. Heyman had given her kids. It was called Charlie's Team. And it was about finding this lily. Anyway, Chris Casey had given me a copy of it. And I should make a copy of my copy because I think she lost hers. But it's, it's, uh, it was really nice. And it was well written. And it was, uh, I mean, it, it had to have been so horrible for them. But they really loved children. And they just did things in Joan's memory to help other children. In fact, instead of flowers, or they asked for donations to help a child that they loved very much and it was it was to help Eddie Deering with his teeth. You know, and, and I thought, 
how, I mean, how magnificent to think of Eddie's teeth when your daughter's just been killed. You know, I mean, they, they were, they were yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was really, yeah, yeah. And so they, they took the money and helped him with that. Terry Rickman was an art class. Right. Yeah, she, because I remember she used to ride the bus and she was always, she was always so sweet. She was the smartest one in her class. After all your research and interviews, et cetera, do you have a gut feeling? You know, I'd almost have to say that it's Wilson just because Ted, Ted just was too soft to do this. I just can't imagine him doing this. You know, I, I don't know. He, he just seemed not, not to have the, the follow through to, to murder someone, but God knows what it takes, you know. Sandy, did you say when Wilson was acquitted that the sheriff said he was leaving Libby alone because he knew who did it? Yes. Was, did, was the, he referring the DA. to Wilson? Or was yeah, he, he, they, he said that he, they knew Wilson had done it. And, and all, the, all the officers that I talked to were, they said no, that it was Wilson, you know. But then I think, well, they're not going to admit that they tried the wrong guy. I mean, even if, you know, they're not going to say even now. But it, it's just amazing. This November will be 50 years that Joan was murdered. And... You know, I know. It just it's amazing. So we talked talk about the autopsy a little bit. Do you know if she was was there any sign that she was sexually assaulted? No, there wasn't. In fact that was another thing that, that Mr. Group brought up at the trial and apparently well this is so rude. But um, apparently he said that they were having unnatural sex because they had oral sex and Ted admitted it. And so that was, and so I guess that was just turned everyone white at the, you know, it was like, oh, how could that be? You know, we don't know anybody that does that, so. I, I wondered because you, because of where she was shot in the head and then. Yeah, it, it, it was, personal. it was personal and, and sexual, yeah. you know, so, it, and they, they, they did do a Florence smear test, which showed no sperm. And but they didn't do any combings or anything to, to compare anything, but she, there wasn't anything you know, any evidence of that. And she was in a nightgown, right? She was yes, there. yes. Did they look at any kind of sexual relations with Dave and her? Because she was only like 10 years older than him at the time. He and claimed he didn't know her, even though he did read the meter at the forestry. But he said the meter was over on the other side of where the office was. So they're sure that he didn't know her? And well, he says he didn't know her, but yeah. But, he, you know, but in town, I mean, and he, he wasn't a Middletown boy, but, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, he could have seen her and, you know. Because it, it, it seems off personal with where she was, how she was shot. Yes. And how yes. low in the stomach she was actually shot. So. And, then, and then I'd even, there was even a theory that someone thought that it was a woman that had killed her, a jealous woman. I don't expect you to say that, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that was, you know, they, they didn't have any, any, evidence that they, they did have um, um, Winifred Ramirez that worked for Ted at the paper um, apparently she had bought some 32 longs at Hardister's and and so Ted was like oh my god this connects me to it he was all panicked about it so they were trying to you know get her to say was it really or get you know the person that sold them to say was it 32s was it 22s was it you know it there, there were just so many, I guess, red herrings thrown in there that, that that's why I try to work with the timeline because there's just things everywhere. Back to Ted's ex-wife is number four. Um, was there any indication it could have been her? I don't know. Well, I, I don't think so because I guess they talked, I guess she wrote Joan a letter, you know, about what a jerk Ted was and just, you know, because she was angry about their divorce. but. They, they were divorced before Ted and Joan started going together, so I don't think there was any jealousy or anything there. But Number five came along quite a bit later? Not that long. Yeah, he and Marjorie got married. Yeah, he, he, he met Marjorie, and then, yeah. And I think, you know, quite a ladies' man. I mean, he was pretty busy. Yeah, very busy. Was she in her 80s? Was she alive now? Yes, she would, have, uh, she would be 83. 84, oh, 84 now. Oh, she, yeah, yeah. I mean, she, the, you know, she should be here. You know, it's it's just so strange. Can I ask also, in, in all 
these interviews you went through with people that knew Ted and his wives, did anybody ever say that he was like a, it sounds like he did a rough type of person, went into any rages or? No, he, he just never, no, it, he was just pretty mild, you know, as far as, and, and people, and, you know, people try and say, oh, he, he did this, he did that. Um, there was a lady, Harriet Madsen, that worked for him at his Calistoga paper, and she kind of said that he, he they had had this wild argument, but uh, Ted denied that it was anything wild, and he just didn't seem like the type. I mean, he was kind of a plodding kind of a guy. Would he have been considered a drinker? Did he drink a lot? She drank a lot. She drank a lot. She drank a lot, yeah. And in fact, when she was with her in-laws, they were on a Caribbean cruise, and apparently she had this flirtation with the ship captain. And she had been drinking a lot, but she had just had another miscarriage, and she was depressed and drinking. And when they got back, her father locked her father-in-law locked her up in this Silver Hill, this psychiatric hospital in Connecticut, which is still they treat alcoholism there. And I guess their family. Uh, in fact, John Dole's cousin contacted me because she had seen something I'd written on the internet and told me that the family kind of had a suite there that they kept for members <laughs> to go dry out once in a while. So, yeah. The wealthy do things differently. So. <laughs> Some of the things Ted brought out at the trial seemed rather divulging for a Oh, well, something and it, that you cared about something so well, much. You know, or, and the thing with Ted, you know, with, with her headstone saying intended bride, when he was talking about, you know, where where they did things and had dinner and listened to the hi-fi, it was always we or our. It was never Jones. And that was Jones' house, but it was, he always made it, you know, ours. And, I mean, maybe it would have been when they got married, but, but he was very... Um, Possessive of her, yes, yes. Did Sue ever say what would happen if he got on the other side of the golf ball or the tennis uh, in bed? I mean, would he get <laughs> <laughs> She did, I guess. I mean, what was the point of that? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. a line there and if you cross it, what happens? He puts on the uniform, Abel. <laughs> <laughs> in the Victorian era, that was extremely common, by the way. Yes. In the early pioneer days, to se uh, to separate the bed, actually, you can really look into that. Usually the other thing was there anyone that like uh, uh, observed that he kind of, you know, flipped out sort of uh, anger, like extreme fast acting anger, and then he pulled back and disguise it, and nobody pick it up. It was not that, that's not one that of the I issues heard. of certain types of personalities. Mm -hmm. it, 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 um, the batter, certain there's many profiles of different batters, but one is the one he just flashes. And then, no and then, control, uh, and then, then he's normal back, again. But he can kill you, yeah. Because yeah. mm -hmm. I had talked to a, a doctor who, who worked at the Napa State Hospital to find out, you know, well, who would do this? And, like, if Wilson did this, c can somebody just go nuts and kill somebody and then go on with their life? I mean, is this something that's just like a one-off thing and then you're done and good? And she said, normally somebody that would do something like this would, you know, it, it's something that you just don't do once. But obviously it depends on the person, and, and we really don't know who did it. And then Ted apparently signed a letter, not in blood, but with Whitey Tollison, about somebody that they thought may have done it. And then they put it, Whitey put it in, in the safe at the store. And then I guess he thought better of it and then took it out and burned it. But I talked to Whitey about a dozen years ago. He was living in Las Vegas. And he said he didn't remember what was in the letter, but they, they had thought one of the, uh, what was in the letter was that one of the fellows from the forestry had come into the store that morning, that Sunday morning, the 20th, and he was white as a sheet. And Whitey had said something, some wisecrack to him, and he didn't even, like, he didn't even hear it. He just was, like, sleepwalking and walked out to his car and or his truck and got in and left. And so that was enough for them to think, well, he must have done it, you know, I mean, but they were just looking for a reason. So they weren't convinced Wilson did it either, then? No. Totally. No. Is he still alive? Who? Wilson? No, he oh, passed away a couple years ago. Yeah. He, he was only 66. Yeah. Yeah. But 
was he um, was he considered a, a drinker? Like uh, numerous people knew him up to a time of his death. Was he considered like an open drinker, or maybe more the closet type? But I'd just be very curious to suspect mm -hmm. drinking. Well, you know, my my memories of Ted, he always had a drink in his hand. Most, you know, it, you know, I'd see him. At, of course, he was at a bar, so you know that wasn't abnormal. But people, I mean, people drank a lot back then. I mean, cocktails, you know, I mean, it was every evening, it was cocktail time. You went to the bar, people, you know, stopped at Nobles. One of the neighbors, the night of the murder, the night before the murder, the 19th, he had stopped at Nobles with his wife, and I didn't know, I guess, I don't know if they had a band in there, it was just a jukebox, but they stopped in for a couple of highballs and to dance a while before they went to Anderson Springs, and I thought, that is so cool. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I just don't do that. Well, Maybe I don't was a lot bigger back then. Yeah, it was, but, you know, but thinking it was a restaurant. And then, you know, they brought up Can Kelly's, you know, and the, which is, you know, I remember going to Can Kelly's for lunch, and and they were trying to, you know, because Joan was friends with Kay and Kelly, and they were trying to bring in all this, you know, jealousy thing, and it, it was just, you know, who, they, they were trying to think of everything, and some of the things were pretty far-fetched and absurd that they brought up, but um, I guess when you don't know, you just thrash around trying to figure out anything that you can find. Um, did anybody think that perhaps Joan was either on anti, I mean, quite a profile losing all those kids, which she have been on antidepressants, or also was in the 60s, was very easy to obtain legally amphetamine. And then the problem with the amphetamine, it get into terrible anger and just snap. Because you know. I'm just curious. Mm -hmm. sort of I, you know, they didn't say anything. See if she, there was, because they went over the bathroom really thoroughly, you know, about the, the cigarette in the toilet, but the, um, they didn't say anything about any meds or anything. So, but but that she did drink, and of course her mother claimed that Ted filled up her drinks when she wasn't looking, and that's what made her drunk. We have a picture up in the back. Yeah. Who's in the picture? Okay, that's Joan, and that's Terry Rincon, the little girl that called her other mother. Mm -hmm. Yes. Your sister was good enough to loan me a copy of the books he wrote about the children she took into the Sierra on the backpacking trip. Yes. And I have arranged with Galen to scan the library copy and make a copy to be here at the museum. Oh, and wonderful. A good one at the library. So if anybody wants to know more about the humans, it will be there soon. Right, that's Charlie's team. Yes, that's wonderful. Oh, that's great. Okay, we're starting to lose our crowd. Um, under one or